In this video, we're going to talk about one of the most widely used research designs, particularly in the field of psychology, correlational studies. In a correlational study, you simply examine the extent to which two variables are correlated with each other. There's a lot of interchangeable words we can use here, whether there's an association between the two variables, whether there's a relationship between the two variables, but all of these terms simply reflect a correlation. Let's start by basically going over a couple examples of a few research questions someone might have that would be appropriate to address using a correlational research design. First of all, are people who have higher marital satisfaction better parents? This is something, for example, that a developmental psychologist might be interested in, but this is great for a correlational design because we have two different variables that we want to know. Is there a relationship between these two, marital satisfaction and parenting quality or ability? Here's another example. Do people who are more creative perform better in school? So here we're looking for a correlation between creativity and academic performance. So what might this look like in the real world? Well, there's a lot of ways you can do a correlational research study. You can do it online via surveys, but let's go over an example of bringing participants into the lab. Usually, this is very unlike a case study in that you will have lots of different participants. So you might have, for example, 150 participants uh, that all come into the lab at different times and you sit them down for like a 30 minute study, okay? And in this study, for this research question, you might assess their creativity somehow, and then you might ask them, what was your GPA in school to assess academic performance? And the end result of a correlational study is always going to be a correlation, which we measure or sort of quantify using Pearson's R, named after the person who invented it, Carl Pearson. And I'm going to focus for the rest of this video, or at least the majority of it, on interpreting a correlation coefficient, interpreting an R value because you're so likely to see correlations both throughout your academic career or, if you're past that point, uh, throughout life in general. These are such widely used measures that it's really important to be able to look at a correlation and understand what it's telling you, because it does convey a lot of information. So there's two important things to know or to look at when you're basically interpreting a correlation coefficient, an R-value. The first thing to pay attention to is the magnitude, which describes the strength of the relationship. So it's important to know that correlations must always be between negative one and positive one. These are numeric values, and if you see a correlation of 36.2, you know something went horribly wrong, and you probably shouldn't trust that researcher at all. Correlations must always be between negative one and positive one, and here's how you can assess the magnitude from the value. Correlations that are closer to an absolute value of 1 represent stronger relationships. So if you see a correlation of you know, 0.9 or negative 0.8, both of those represent very strong relationships between the two variables. In contrast, if you see correlations close to 0, for example, 0 0.06 or negative 0 0.07, those are both examples of really weak correlations because they're close to 0. So that's the magnitude of the relationship, really easy to tell that right off the bat. The second thing to pay attention to is the valence, meaning the charge of the relationship, which is basically just a fancy way of saying the nature of the relationship. What does the relationship between these two variables looks like? Is it positive, is it negative, or is it zero? And that's what I'm going to focus on next. Let's talk about each in turn, starting with positive correlations. A positive correlation is one in which as one variable changes, the other variable tends to change in the same direction. So the two variables are working together. Let's take a look at that graphically. What you're seeing here is a scatter plot. It's a type of graph, a visual representation of data in which each dot on the graph is a single participant. And we have two different variables we're looking at here. We're looking at weight and we're looking at height. And notice, as one variable changes, the other tends to change in the same direction. As height tends to increase, weight tends to increase as well. Think about it, this makes a lot of sense. People who are really short, for example, tend to weigh less, whereas people who are taller tend to weigh more, probably because they're taller. Now, I will note that you're always going to have some exceptions to this rule. Correlations describe the relationship between two variables among you know, lots of different people, but there are always going to be some exceptions. So you might have somebody who's really short and heavy, 
You might have someone else who's really tall, but, you know, thin and doesn't weigh too much. And that's perfectly fine. But the positive correlation describes the relationship between the two variables in general, overall, across everybody. So here, this is a great way to tell what type of relationship you're looking at on a graph by trying to draw a line that best fits the data. So here we have a line that starts from the bottom left and goes up to the top right, and that's an easy way to tell that this is a positive correlation. All right, let's talk for a minute about negative correlations, because this is where I tend to see the most mistakes on exams and things like that, and just generally the most misunderstanding. Negative correlations are correlations in which, as one variable changes, the other variable tends to change in the opposite direction. So here the two variables are sort of working against each other, indirectly, in opposite directions. So let's see that visually as well as we did before. So what you're looking at here is the correlation, the scatter plot, the relationship between hours of sleep and tiredness. Well, as you would expect, as hours of sleep tends to increase, how tired somebody is tends to decrease. And we can see that here. People who got lots of sleep the night before report being not very tired, whereas people who got very little sleep the night before tend to report being very tired, which makes a lot of sense. Now, if we're sort of graphing the line of best fit between these two variables, you'll see that the line goes from the top left down to the bottom right, which is a clear giveaway that this is a negative correlation. All right, last but not least, let's talk about the zero correlation. This correlation is the easiest to understand because it simply means no relationship. So if you're looking at the value of the correlation, it's just going to be something close to zero. If you're looking at the correlation visually on a scatter plot, it's just going to look like a big blob of dots, where you can't really draw a clear line that best fits the data. There's really not a great way to do that. Now, what you're looking at here, by the way, is the correlation between the number of hours of sleep participants got the night before and their shoe size. And this makes sense that it's a zero correlation because we have no reason to predict that people who have bigger feet, for example, might sleep better. It's just going to be a zero correlation, no relationship. Now, correlational studies are awesome and they're really useful. They tell you whether there are relationships between variables in the world, great information to have. But remember, as we talked about in a previous video, when we learned about the six principles of scientific thinking, correlation does not imply causation. Just because you see a correlation between two variables, this doesn't necessarily mean that those two variables are causally linked. Assuming that that's the case mistakenly is known as the causation fallacy, and this happens all the time. For example, here are some actual newspaper headlines that make this mistake, that make this causation fallacy. Now, I'll mention that some of these are still out there. Others have been retracted because they just made such an egregious mistake and lots of people found out and it wasn't very pleasant. But all of these headlines are basically the mistake of taking a correlation and inferring causation from it. Here's one example. Low self-esteem shrinks brain. All right. Through all of these, I encourage you to think about alternative explanations because it's probably not the case that having low self-esteem literally makes your brain smaller over time. It might be something else. For example, perhaps people who tend to be taller have more self-esteem and they probably have bigger brains as a result just because they're taller and they're in a bigger body. Now, I'll mention, by the way, if you're short, don't feel bad because it's much more important to have lots of folds in your brain for intelligence rather than just the overall size of your brain. Otherwise, whales would be the smartest beings on the planet, and they're probably not. But in any case, here are some other examples. Housework cuts breast cancer risk. Certainly no ulterior motives there, right? Wearing a helmet puts cyclists at risk, suggests research. So on this basis, should you decide if you're going to cycle not to wear a helmet? No, there's an alternative explanation. It's probably the case that cyclists who are wearing helmets feel more confident to ride in the middle of the street and to take riskier moves, whereas cyclists who don't have a helmet are probably playing it safe because they know they're undergeared. Here are two more. Winning the World Cup lowers heart attack deaths. And finally, my personal favorite, eating fish prevents crime. All right, so if you want to be safe and not engage in any criminal activity, definitely eat a lot of fish, okay? All right, so in any case, correlations are useful, but make sure to take them with a grain of salt. Now, in our next video, we're going to talk about the first research design that finally allows us to make causal inferences about the world, experiments.